Have a look at this table uh, of properties and property prices over the last 47 years. I saw this recently from SQM Research. The numbers are mind-blowing. Who hasn't heard the expression? Property doubles every 10 years. Do property values double every 10 years? Property doubles every seven to 10 years in Australia. This is it, right? This is that? If we're supposed to believe that the next 47 years are gonna be the same as the last 47 years, the median price in the Eastern Capitals will be over $50 million. That's an average growth of about four and a half thousand percent across Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne. Call me crazy, but I just don't see our incomes growing to that level to support a property market where the average family in suburbia has a property that's worth $50 million. Unless we fall into a disastrous inflationary period when $50 million won't really be $50 million anyway. Quick aside, uh, did you know that in Zimbabwe in 2008, annual inflation was estimated to be 89.7 sextillion percent, which is just like an impossibly large number to actually even comprehend without writing it down. I'm 97% sure that's correct. It's a lot of zeros I might have miscounted. Australia's inflation just nudged above 2% for the first time in years. Anyway, about our incomes. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the Australian median annual income uh, in June 1973 was $5,600 roughly. The Australian median annual average income in November 2019 was around about $86,000, which is like a ballpark increase of 1,500% in that same time period uh, as the property table from earlier. Property values in that same period have increased in value three times faster than incomes have increased. So why has property prices grown so much faster than income growth? It's a loaded question and there are hundreds and hundreds of reasons why this is actually the case. But there's two key macro level changes that we've experienced in society uh, over this time period that I want to point out today because I think they've played a massive role in this. The first is related to us. The banks, the lenders, and the brokers. A generation ago, acceptable debt to income ratios, that's how much debt you have versus your income, uh, were much lower. They usually wouldn't lend more than four times your income, a maximum debt to income ratio of four. Borrowers needed a 20 to 30% deposit, and the entire lending process was manual, labor intensive, uh, processed and managed by humans at the bank. Today, advanced metrics and mathematical models have completely changed the risk appetite of banks. They've also outsourced a significant portion of this process to automation, and they will offer loans to borrowers uh, with much lower deposits and at a much higher debt to income ratio, or usually both. Wider access to credit means there are more buyers who can uh, afford every price band in the market and this drives prices up and the prices keep going up until the bank says no you can't borrow that much lending practices and the data available will continue to improve uh, and online lending is such an interesting case study playing out in front of us as we speak but it's really difficult to imagine access to credit getting this much easier again over the next generation. Deposit requirements have been cut by 75 to 85 percent in relative terms and acceptable debt to income ratios have more than doubled in some cases over that same time period. Which leads me directly to my second point, the two income household. I've had a hard time finding perfect reliable data uh, over the exact same 47 year time frame that we started with on this one. So let me start by piecing together some actual factual stuff that I can find um, and verify, and then we'll sort of drift back into the larger point uh, of what I think all this actually represents. By the way, this is all data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics as well. Since 1970, the female participation rate in the workforce has more than doubled. Since 1978, the growth of women in the workforce in Australia has been 2.5 times the equivalent growth rate for men in the workforce over that same period. 
Since 1991, the proportion of Australian households with children that have both parents working has increased by roughly 20%. That took me like eight takes to get through that without stumbling. Now this isn't a perfect collection of data, but to me the point here is clear. Ask your parents or your grandparents, there are more two income households now than there was 47 years ago. Now if we're earning more per household and the bank will lend us more money per dollar earned, how can prices do anything but increase at a faster rate? This is a generational shift that can't be repeated unless we have a serious change in marital laws and cohabitation customs in Australia. Polygamy. I had to Google it before I said it out loud, but that, that, that's what that is. If we don't have three or four income households become the norm in Australia anytime in the next 47 years, we're not going to have the same increase to Australian household incomes to support the same level of property price growth over the next 47 years. I think I said that right. All right, so this is me telling you why property growth in the next 47 years might not be as significant as property growth in the last 47 years. And I'm basically saying that you shouldn't buy, right? Absolutely not. You don't need 5,000% property price growth in a single adult lifetime to make owning property worthwhile. Rents are going to keep increasing uh, with inflation and wage growth as time goes on. And no matter how good of a tenant you are, if you diligently pay your rent every month for 25 years, your landlord is probably not gonna send you a letter that says, thanks mate, that's enough, no more rent needed from you. Interest rates are also at all-time lows, uh, meaning despite the higher property prices that we're faced with, we've never had a lower interest penalty to pay when reducing debt. Now here's where it gets really interesting for me. 30 years ago, you could earn up to a maximum of 15% interest on term deposits and savings accounts with 10% rates a bit more common to be fair. Inflation hovered above 10% for much of the 70s and spent most of the 80s above 5% too. Put another way, the price of a basket of groceries in the 70s and 80s went up roughly the same rate as the interest you saved on your savings, which went up roughly the same as the value of your property did every year. Today, our baskets of groceries are still increasing in cost each year, but at about one fifth of the rate that they were back in the 70s and the 80s. Our savings are still growing each year at about one fifth of the rate that they were back then. If our properties grow at something resembling one fifth of the rate from 47 years ago, isn't that about what we should be expecting anyway? This is a super long winded way of me driving home a simple point that I always try to come back to. Buy a place you like that you can afford and pay it off quickly. Your property doesn't need to double in value every seven to 10 years to be worthwhile. I hope that wasn't too numbery today, um, but I really wanted this to be a helpful discussion. We've got the new home builder grants out. Everyone's talking inflation this, property prices that. I really do believe that this stuff will stand the test of time. Buy something you can afford and pay it off. I, I hope this video was helpful. If there's anyone that you think might benefit from listening to something like this, please share it uh, or jump on our company website. We'd love to help you out further.